thank you uh, to the TEDx crew for inviting me. Especially want to thank my old friend Crystal for extending the first uh, wave to become part of this uh, event this evening. Uh, so I'm Professor Eric, and I'm going to tell you about the peace-loving soul of Bellarmine University. Uh, and that involves Father John Loftus and his friends. Those would be Brother Thomas Merton, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., and also Jerry Garcia. So going back to 1950, the height of what's called both the Cold War and the Red Scare, soon after the Soviet Union exploded its first atomic bomb, even sooner after Mao Zedong had declared the existence of the People's Republic of China and taken 800 million more people into the red zone, as it were, of the Cold War. And then Congressman Richard Nixon had exposed a Soviet spy within the State Department named Alger Hiss. Isn't that a great name for a spy? <laughs> and very famously, Joseph McCarthy Senator from Wisconsin gave a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, where he claimed to have a list of 126 known communists at the State Department. And so the Red Scare was off, uh, and then it turned very hot with the outbreak of the Korean War. So at this time in history, that's when the Archdiocese of Louisville, Kentucky, decided it would be a good time to start a new college for young men. Now, during the Cold War, Red Scare, the Red War, Cold Scare, it's kind of all part of the same thing. And it's a time when the faith of nationalism triumphed over the reason of compassion and cooperation and nonviolence. And so I think it was in that spirit that uh, the founders of the university chose a notorious anti-intellectual to name the place after St. Robert Bellarmine, a Jesuit cardinal and a father of the church. Now, mind you, the, card the, the founders of Bellarmine College were well aware of the reputation of Cardinal Bellarmine. Uh, he had been the head of the Roman Inquisition. Uh, and in that capacity, he had condemned to a horrible torture and death the free-thinking and outspoken Giordano Bruno, whose statue stands in a plaza in Rome today. And most famously, or infamously, uh, he told the brilliant mathematician, the improver of the telescope, uh, to be quiet. And then Galileo Galilei had proven heliocentric theory that Copernicus had had the good sense not to publish until after he died. Uh, and that, of course, contradicted the Bible. And so Galileo, Galileo, Galilei had to stop spreading those crazy ideas, said Cardinal Bellarmine. Um, and then, uh, at, uh, after Bellarmine's death, when Galileo, who had not been able to restrain himself, was brought back for a second trial, it was Bellarmine's words that were used to condemn Galileo to house arrest for the rest of his life. So, they sent him and his telescope back to Florence, and Galileo lived in his little Tuscan village uh, for the next 18 years, never left his, his house, uh, and he died there. Uh, and so it was that seven years before the groundbreaking on the first building here at Bellarmine College, Bertolt Brecht, the avant-garde German playwright, uh, had cast Cardinal Bellarmino as the villain in his masterful play, uh, Galileo, Life of Galileo. Um, and and there's, there's Cardinal Bellarmine on the left wearing a sheep's mask as he does throughout the performance. Uh, and so it would seem that uh, the, um, uh, the powers that were in the archdiocese had intended Bellarmine College to be a bastion of conservatism, given that name, right? Uh, but instead, the first dean of the college, John T. Loftus, a Franciscan, uh, deflected the trajectory, the, the trajectory of, of the soul, really, of this place uh, through his shaping of it in the first years of its existence all the way until 1969 
when he died. This is a beautiful uh, uh, drawing of him done uh, posthumously by Charles Campbell, uh, graduate of the class of 1971. So it was, uh, it was the Franciscan Loftus who planted the seeds of Franciscan compassion and, and, and peace and understanding here at this hilltop campus and gave it that unique uh, aspect to begin with. A lot of this art is my own. <laughs> if it's not signed, it's mine. <laughs> so it was President Alfred Horrigan who hired Dean Loftus and who supported him in his efforts to shape the college. And that began with diversity. Uh, it was Dean Loftus who brought in the first African-American faculty member, Dr. Henry Wilson, an eminent chemist who became not just the first tenured professor, but the first full professor at Bellarmine University and taught until 1969. He uh, is among the notable Kentucky African Americans. And then uh, Father Loftus decided that the, in 1959, the next instructor had to be a woman. And he recruited um, uh, a PhD uh, recently minted from the University of Minnesota, originally from Montana, a very uh, maverick sort of individual, Margaret H. Mahoney. Uh, and um, they had to actually build a bathroom for her because the monks hadn't thought about a women's restroom <laughs> when they designed their college for young men. Uh, and, and Father Loftus chose well because Dr. Mahoney taught here for the next 53 years. Uh, if you can wrap your head around that. And she was, her hiring, her existence here, was a long step toward Father Loftus steering Bellarmine College toward a merger with uh, the much more venerable women's college from the other side of town, Ursuline College, founded in 1923. Uh, and so that merger occurred in 1968. Uh, during that one year, uh, that we had uh, the rather ungainly name of Bellarmine Ursuline College uh, but then just reduced it back to Bellarmine College. In the meantime, Father Loftus had decided that there needed to be a civil rights march on Kentucky's capital. And he pulled some strings and invited some people that he knew. Uh, and so he got to the party, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Jackie Robinson Jr. and the Queen of Gospel, Mahalia Jackson, and the incendiary shock jock. Uh, a shock comedian, uh, Dick Gregory, uh, as well as the folks singing trio Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, whose big hit song, uh, Blown in the Wind, was on the radio waves at that time. And he brought Bellarmine with him as well <laughs> to the March on Frankfurt uh, with President uh, with President Horrigan's support. Uh, he uh, gave absences excused the absences of any student who wanted to go, and he told the faculty they could cancel their, cap their classes for the same reason, and he provided transportation. Seven school buses filled with Bellarmine students and like-minded young women from Ursuline descended on Frankfurt to take part in the march that day. And then the next year, uh, then Father John uh, was uh, reunited with his friend Martin at the much more famous Selma, Alabama march. During the mid-1960s, Bellarmine became a haven for young men who were opposed to the Vietnam War and were afraid of being thrown into combat. And they knew that they could come here and get the status of conscientious objectors. Uh, and if they were drafted, they would not have to serve in combat roles, but in medical roles or, or, or other nonviolent roles. Uh, and the, they knew that the peace-loving faculty, led by Father John, would facilitate their gaining that status. Uh, and, um, and being able to uh, follow in the footsteps of Muhammad Ali and not be involved in the Vietnam War. Uh, by 1968, Father John had so changed the temper of the times here that Bellarmine was sort of in the groove of the counterculture. And uh, the Grateful Dead played here. It's a rather famous show among dedicated deadheads because it's the only live show where they played Rosemary off Oxymoxy. <laughs> which they put on their Greatest Hits album. How weird is that? <laughs> they only performed a Greatest Hit once? But most important, Father Jean was a deep soulmate friend of the great Father Lewis, 
uh, Brother Lewis, Thomas Merton, uh, the, the, uh, the silent Cistercian monk of Gethsemane Abbey. Uh, their voluminous correspondence attests to their close bond. Now, in 1968 uh, is when uh, Brother Lewis decided to leave the Abbey and go to visit Thailand, and he died suddenly there on the 10th of December. Uh, and it was um, on the 11th of December then, uh, one day after the death of, uh, of Merton and three days after the dead show, that, uh, that Dean Loftus wrote a poem uh, and released it to the student body. And it goes in very, uh, just a brief excerpt. It's called Beyond the Seven Story Mountain. It begins, Thomas Merton is dead. Let the world maintain his celebration. Merton loved God and men and trees and food and drink and song and laughter, thick tomes and bongo drums, Aquinas and Ginsburg and Joan Baez and Pope John. Fill the emptiness with light and sound, cheerful, triumphant noise, for Merton now knows God, he wrote. Now, the most important moment in the formation of uh, Bellarmine's peace-loving soul had already occurred, and that was when Thomas Merton had decided to bequeath his extensive personal archive of papers to his friend John's Bellarmine College. And it's the existence of those precious documents here that makes the place enduringly unique. People come from all over the world to take advantage of the archive. It was less than a month later, on the 7th of January, 1969, when John Loftus himself went to know God with his friend Thomas. And a student at the time, uh, Evelyn Wilson, uh, wrote a poem or a, a, a poem-like essay that concluded this way. Is Father John really dead? He would rather we answer with our lives. Is his life part of us? And are we alive? So thank you, Father John Loftus, OFM. You live on here at Bellarmine University. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>